So good morning, um, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Bill Taylor. <clears throat> I'm uh, one of the vice presidents here at the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm very glad to, to welcome you to this discussion uh, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, today, we have uh, a great panel for you um, that's looking forward, I'm looking forward to hearing them. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your questions and comments. The Institute of Peace um, has been working on this issue for some time. The Institute of Peace, uh, we seek nonviolent resolution of violent conflict. And there's a violent conflict going on in Ukraine. Um, so this is an appropriate uh, uh, topic for the Institute of Peace to, uh, to focus on. Uh, we, Institute of Peace works in Washington, making recommendations to the Congress and to the administration, uh, but we also work in the field. Um, and we've got people in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Nigeria, in Tunisia, in Burma, Pakistan, Colombia, uh, and we're working in Ukraine. Um, Russia against Ukraine, first in Crimea, uh, then in Donbass, is violent conflict. So this is, again, this is what the Institute of Peace is designed to to focus on and try to help resolve. Today, we're gonna to focus on Donbass um, and we're not forgetting about Crimea. We'll come back to that, but uh, we're gonna focus on Donbass. We've been working this issue Institute of Peace, for several years. Um, we've done a couple of track two dialogues with senior Ukrainians and senior Russians, uh, senior Americans. Uh, we've come up with some ideas and suggestions about how to resolve this conflict in Donbass. I held a conference here two years ago um, uh, with experts from around the world, including leading Ukrainians. We had Minister Avakov join us uh, in person. We could do things in person at that time. And now, now we're on, we're on this medium. We are, we're, we've got some active dialogues, people to people dialogues that the Institute of Peace is sponsoring near the line of contact with people on both sides of the line. Today, we're gonna to talk about two questions. Um, uh, first, do the circumstances in the world today um, allow us to look for new opportunities uh, to resolve this conflict in Donbass? The new, the new circumstances are the ceasefire is holding. There's been a ceasefire in Ukraine for what, Ambassador, three years, three, three months, which were three years, but three months um, and counting, the ceasefire continues. Um, European sanctions are holding. Um, people might not have predicted that a couple of years ago, but the Europeans have been strong on, on sanctions. The U.S., of course, sticks with our sanctions, and uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began, um, is engaged in this issue. Um, he and uh, George Kent, whom we will hear from, hear from a little bit later on today, um, were in the region, and, and were in Kiev, and in Moscow, and having the conversations. So the U.S. is engaged. There's turmoil in Eurasia. Um, there's Habarov, there's Belarus, there's Kyrgyzstan, Navalny was poisoned, Armenia, Azerbaijan. There's, there's a lot going on there that uh, people, decision makers um, have, to, have to focus on. So maybe these new circumstances suggest an opportunity, present an opportunity that we should take advantage of. And if so, the second question is, if the time is right, what are the solutions? How would, how could we, how can we, what could we think about? What new ideas are there? What new proposals, what new formats, um, what new ideas are there to solve this problem? So those are the two questions that we want to want to raise here today. So I'm about to conclude and I'm going to turn the, uh, the floor, the mic, the Zoom call over to the uh, Ukrainian ambassador to the United States. Uh, ambassador Yelchenko will give introductory remarks uh, he will then um, introduce the Deputy Prime Minister um, of Ukraine, who has been deeply involved, principally involved in these issues. And Prime, Deputy Prime Minister Reznikov um, will join us for, for this, this conversation. After the Deputy Prime Minister's uh, remarks, uh, Don Jensen, who you see on the, on the call, um, is our D Russia director here at the Institute of Peace. Um, and Don uh, will introduce Arisia Lutsevich, um, which I'm very pleased to have from, from, uh, from uh, Chatham House. Arisia, thank you very much for being here. Um, and as you can see on the, as we can see on the screen, uh, George Kent um, had planned to be here. He was called at the last minute um, to another meeting for George. I mean, he, as, uh, as people know, 
Uh, George Kent has responsibility not just for Ukraine, his most re important responsibility, let's just say, uh, but also for Belarus, also for Armenia and Azerbaijan. So George has a lot going on, but he will be back. And uh, those of us on the screen right now, we can see that George is, uh, um, is, is planning to be here. He'll be late. Um, so after Orisha makes comments on hopefully on these two topics, I will try to summarize what I have heard from George, but also from Deputy Secretary Steve Began, um, um, and and try to present in George's absence until George arrives uh, the, the U.S. position, which which will set the stage for for those conversations. Um, George will come back and he will either correct me or, or uh, elaborate or, or, or whatever, but he'll take questions and Don will, Don will be sure to integrate him in. Don will then, Don Jensen will then moderate a discussion among all the people on this screen, um, as well as you, the participants. Um, and your participation is very important to us. We would like to get not only your questions, we want questions, but also many of you, some of you, will have an idea about how to solve this conflict, to give to the Deputy Prime Minister, to give to the Ambassador, to give to George Kent. Um, we would love to get those comments. This is a good opportunity to, to put out new ideas. Again, if the time is ripe, um, then this is the time for, for new ideas. Those questions um, and those comments, what you can do in the audience is type them out. Um, there's a question box in the bottom of the screen that you're now on. If you've gotten this far, you can see the screen and you can see the button where you can type in your questions and you can type them in in English, type them in in Ukrainian. If you were, you can type them in in Russian um, and we will send them on to Don who will then pose them to one of the, one of the speakers. Uh, please, um, Identify yourself and your affiliation as you as you type in your questions. With that, Ambassador Yachenko, I am very pleased to uh, turn it over to you for uh, introductory comments. So, Ambassador, thank you very much, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like, first of all, to welcome uh, all of you at this virtual event organized by our good friends and partners from the U.S. Institute of Peace an institution that advocates and promotes peace as one of the fundamental principles for the international community. The topics of today's discussion cannot be chosen better, as we all are strongly united by the intent of achieving peace. As Eleanor Roosevelt once wrote, it is not enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. Almost seven years ago, the war in Ukraine and Donbass was something unimaginable. Unfortunately, now it is real, very real, and it is not just the war that matters to Ukraine. It is closer to everyone else than anyone can think. Let me just give you a few numbers. 7% of Ukraine's territory remain illegally occupied by Russia. Over 14,000 people have been killed over 27,000 wounded, and almost 2 million have been forced to flee their homes in Crimea and Donbass and became internally displaced persons or refugees. The occupation and attempted annexation of Ukraine's Crimea by the Russian Federation and its role in provoking, fanning up, and sustaining armed conflict in Ukraine's Donbass region is one of the most vivid examples on, of unscrupulous attempts to change and reshape the international system to one's own liking, with full and blatant disregard for long settled peremptory norms of international law. We must resolutely resist this kind of change because it destabilizes the international system and recklessly pushes the world closer to the brink of global war. Over all these years, we have proved that Ukraine really strives for peace. We managed to unblock the dialogue. We resumed meetings of the leaders of the Normandy four countries. Significant progress has been made in mutual release of detainees. Another attempt of a comprehensive ceasefire on July 27th faces numerous attempts by the Russian-led forces to disrupt it. 
All our efforts being derailed by Russia, which continues to supply heavy weapons and ammunition across our border to increase its military capabilities along the border with Ukraine and to militarize Crimea. We are grateful to our international partners for their assistance and support along the way, especially the United States of America, our long-standing strategic partner. As long as the war in Ukraine continues, a war in the, in the heart of Europe, the whole world will feel the pain and suffering of civilians. Events like today's discussion help us to join our efforts and see how we can best address the challenges we face. So I would like to once again thank the organizers for putting it together. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, Minister for Temporarily Occupied Territories of Ukraine and IDPs, Mr. Oleksiy Reznikov, a prominent Ukrainian lawyer who took upon an important task of leading and guiding the ministry and who can give you the first-hand information about current situation in Donbass and our views on moving forward. I thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Reznikov. He needs to activate his mic. I don't hear him. Okay, good. Uh-uh. So don't. Azar. Yes. Yes. Говорить тоді не зупиняючись, перекладати де паралельно, правильно я розумію? Добре. А гарного часу доби, тому що кого рано кого... My greetings to you, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I am thankful for inviting me to address this uh, esteemed audience. And there are two issues today on our agenda, as you propose is number one whether this is a good time to settlement and uh, of the conflict and second how this possible uh, settlement may look like uh, to give a short answer i believe that in my uh, persuasion i think there is a corridor of opportunities today and this moment gives us a chance to finish this hybrid war that started back in 2014 with uh, Russia's aggression by occupying uh, the Crimea and Sevastopol, and then it uh, evolved into a hot phase in uh, part of Donbass. I'm sure you know that uh, a bigger part of uh, Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions were occupied, but owing to efforts of the Russian military anti-terrorist operation were deoccupied and a number of cities such as Slavyansk and others are now back under Ukrainian constitutional rule. But there is uh, some part of Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions which are still occupied. I cannot tell you how this settlement can look, but I'm sure I know how it cannot look like. There are certain uh, red lines that we will never cross, and uh, uh, this is something that uh, the public understands, uh, the government, most of this Verkhovna uh, Rada, so I think there is a, a social consensus here. Uh, the red lines are we cannot possibly make any changes in the con to the constitution of Ukraine, no matter how much uh, um, uh, this is brought up by propaganda uh, mongers of the Kremlin. Uh, attempts to federalize the country is unacceptable. We will not uh, take uh, any risks uh, that will threaten Ukraine's territory and integrity. That is obvious. At this time, 
uh, conducting a political uh, settlement via uh, local elections in the occupied territories is impossible without uh, removal of um, uh, border control uh, the, of the border between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, the Minsk uh, agreement say something different. They say that uh, border control has to be removed the day after the elections. But today, all the expert conclusions, uh, as we study any military conflicts around the world, they say that if there is the uh, government has no control of its borders, that means the uh, conflict will, will not be resolved. I recently returned from Croatia, where I studied the experience of the Croatian conflict settlement 25 years ago, and some pro-Russian uh, media um, uh, accused me of studying Croatian cleansing effort, uh, experience. In reality, we studied started their peaceful uh, efforts experience, and we made some parallels with uh, Ukraine, and we learned that we have to study Croatian ex experience, but it will be the Ukrainian model of peaceful reintegration of uh, provisionally occupied territories. Each uh, of us has uh, their own uh, history. There are some starting uh, similarities, but there are some significant differences as well. Um, about uh, Croatian experience, uh, you can uh, learn more from the interviews I'm uh, preparing right now. We have uh, borrowed some of their ideas and experience. Also, another uh, little uh, comment on what was happening here. In 2014, the Minsk agreements were signed as a political diplomatic arrangement, but not an international law uh, item that uh, was uh, uh, what that would have been approved by the government or the, the parliament. And then there were situation uh, uh, de Baltsevo with uh, potential loss of lives of Ukrainian um, uh, soldiers. And uh, we were forced to uh, make those arrangements. But time has uh, evolved and now Ukraine, uh, Minsk agreements have to be mo modernized. We are not the only ones to say this. Um, uh, Mrs. Merkel was saying the same uh, in her speech in Paris, saying that uh, Minsk agreements are not carved in stone. And at this time, this is the legacy we're working with, and we recognize that Norman, Normandy format must be the, the main format at the level of international leaders in political practice. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uses uh, uh, uses this. We have a Minsk format for the trilateral uh, contact uh, consulting group. Uh, we were able to complete uh, separation of forces in three uh, towns. We were able to accomplish uh, a, a non um, uh, a uh, regime of uh, ceasefire in uh, along the separation line. There are some some uh, shots, but not a single life or or uh, wounded a soldier were lost. Uh, and we are preparing to open two new checkpoints in uh, Zolote uh, that was discussed in Paris. We have accomplished some exchanges of uh, detained persons. We have identified four other towns for separation of forces. And uh, we have uh, made uh, advances in regarding uh, plans for humanitarian demining. But uh, further progress is now blocked by uh, current position of the Russian Federation and their proxies who represent the occupation regi regimes. In fact, they represent um, the Russian Federation citizens. We have informed uh, the world they are distributing uh, uh, they they, they uh, have st they have uh, Russian citizenship, so we perceive them as Russian representatives. Uh, Ukraine does not have to wait for goodwill in the Kremlin. We have to continue in our own format, 
and building our uh, landscape and waiting for this moment when in that corridor of opportunity there may come the right moment for a possible settlement. We understand that for pragmatic Russians uh, it's not, they're not interested in keeping uh, Donbass under control for a long time, especially with the current uh, economic changes in the world linked to uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, uh, oil prices. We understand that the developments around the Russian Federation, including Belarus, including the um, uh, more acute conflict in uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. We understand that um, uh, conflict, uh, violent conflicts do not provide a solution. And by the way, in Karabakh, um, the possible, um, uh, the search of possible um, settlement was actually uh, being done in the in in Minsk 30 years ago with OSCE uh, mediation, and we can see that in 30 years they were not able to accomplish a good result. And now there is a this. Then uh, Azerbaijan decided to deoccupy um, uh, occupied territories in a military format, but we maintain. We uh, our uh, preference for the format uh, of uh, negotiations that that we've been using. It's a virtual Minsk format. We haven't been meeting in Minsk. We do video conferences like we are talking with you now. And participants of the uh, consultations see a Ukrainian um, uh, banner behind me, and uh, the. Um, the uh, backdrop with our logo of the ministry and uh, Mr. Kravchuk, our uh, former uh, first president, uh, was uh, sitting here and talking to them uh, just yesterday. While I'm talking about change of landscape, um, I should also mention what depends on us. There are several things. We realize that only a strong army uh, is uh, a uh, an ally of Ukraine that ha will uh, make our northern um, uh, neighbor uh, recognize it. So we have to continue building up our Ukrainian military as a partner of the government and uh, we uh, with the help of our national partners uh, to, to show our strength. And, you know, there was uh, military training recently. And uh, when uh, uh, U.S. and British uh, air um, uh, military planes flew over Kiev and the Dnieper, that was a strong demonstration uh, that we have those uh, partners and allies. Second is economic uh, transformation. Uh, we have a goal uh, for the ministry that I'm leading. We are preparing uh, a project of economic uh, rebuilding of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk provinces uh, that are under, under Ukraine's control. We are preparing a concept of economic development that will um, uh, provide them with the status of priority development territories. Uh, some may call them free economic zones or offshore zones, but I'm using the legal term, territories of priority development. That's what our laws will uh, provide. So the, this includes several ideas. First, we understand that without financial support of uh, civil, the civilized world, we will not be able to um, bring back to life those territories devastated by the war, uh, those communities which uh, have been deoccupied and uh, there'll be more territories to, that we will deoccupy, we need to help them restore their infrastructure, improve the quality of life and uh, capability of uh, the communities. We understand that Ukraine's uh, government budget does not have enough uh, resources for that. Various uh, estimates suggest that the losses were very big and we cannot count on donor support or credit support. That will not provide uh, sufficient uh, resources. So we want to create uh, proper legal preconditions so investors would be able to come and bring their money. There are three things that an investor wants to see. One is coverage of political and uh, military risks. Second is the question of uh, what we call the rule of law. Uh, fair justice. And third is clear and understandable rules. Then an investor will feel comfortable in that environment. If you add to this certain motivations of certain uh, tax uh, burdens and uh, uh, customs duties uh, and uh, better uh, c conditions for uh, withdrawal of uh, earned capital, uh, 
those will be good incentives. Then there are three more things to be addressed. That's infrastructure, uh, labor market, and uh, uh, sales markets. And uh, so we have been building more roads in those territories than uh, they ever had in 25 years. And we are now looking at a project of uh, collaboration with local governments for a renewal of uh, railroad communication. We are discussing how to plug in um, uh, electricity supply to the uh, destroyed territories. Uh, number two, um, labor market. Uh, there is 2.5 million uh, residents populating those territories now. Many of them, uh, uh, for, as Mr. Ambassador mentioned, about 1.5 million uh, uh, forced um, uh, uh, displaced persons and they are ready to come back. Uh, we also understand that across uh, the border there is the European community. We have the appropriate uh, agreements with the European Union, which allows Ukraine to be a participant to all the trade operations. But uh, the recent developments with the pandemic, when the whole world was trying to buy everything in China from uh, protective masks to uh, artificial ventilation devices. We understand that uh, this creates uh, challenges. It's much better for the European Union to have production of those uh, products closer next door. And so if you do place them in Ukraine, in Donetsk, Luhansk and Kherson pro uh, provinces uh, would be much better. I think that even as you produce a certain experience uh, for uh, for U.S. Um, uh, for, for for the United States, this could also be of interest if we uh, produce uh, some uh, products for the United States and supply them there. Those uh, certain uh, political and um, economic risks can could be covered with creation of uh, insurance uh, uh, funds. Uh, with joint uh, resources. We are also working on the concept of transition period, which includes the concept of transitional justice. This is something very important, and it is always discussed uh, by uh, the United Nations and others. And uh, when uh, UN Secretary General was speaking about certain uh, principles of transitional justice, this includes uh, the right for justice, the right for protection, the right for truth, and we are working on that and we hope that our parliament will soon discuss a uh, draft law that will have definitions of what transition period is and what kind of animosity can be uh, envisaged and uh, who will have to uh, be taken to justice. But um, this uh, transition justice is first and foremost will uh, provide the, uh, will 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 ensure that will 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 define that uh, the people who are currently uh, present in the um, occupied territories are essentially um, uh, hostages and they shouldn't uh, shouldn't be afraid but they should just uh, keep uh, patience um, and uh, despite their so-called Stockholm syndrome they need to know that uh, the culprits will be uh, punished, will be held responsible and punished when their cases are examined. Another block of issues is improvement of international support and, e and effective um, support because Ukraine alone at this time will not be able to find a way out of this situation. Uh, by the way, the example of Croatia that we looked at during their uh, peaceful reintegration, we could see that there were two uh, basic uh, feelings uh, that dominate in the society. One is fear, the other is distrust. 
those two emotions uh, really um, are an obstacle to uh, successful reintegration and uh, peaceful development, then there has to be some third actor who can help, who, um, uh, who gets more trust, who will uh, be able to reduce the fear, degree of fear. And so I think that uh, international participation, the UN mandate that allowed to create a transitional administration that that was uh, operating in those territories of northern Slavonia and other lands along the Danube River, which in the course of uh, a year and a half, that's how long the transition period lasted, and this administration allowed to uh, renew the operations of local uh, communities, local governments, and um, uh, or organize uh, w running water supplies and uh, solid waste removal. And uh, in the end, they uh, held elections uh, for local governments, and uh, they came back, went back to normal uh, governance operations. So we need to work on that. We understand we need alliances. We certainly count on U.S. strategic partnership on this, because uh, it's not only all those bodies are not only territorially located there, but we also understand that mentally uh, there's a lot of uh, closeness, uh, US, uh, Canada, Croatia, Poland, Lithuania, we believe that we have uh, a lot, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, I think, it about diaspora. So I think, uh, I think we can get all that support. There is a Ukrainian saying, if we join together, it's easier to even uh, beat our dead. So we must be together. And then, of course, information uh, work is important. This hybrid war has information war as a component. So today, the opportunity to deliver a Ukrainian signal is limited, but at the same time, a Kremlin counter propaganda uh, reaches. Uh, 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 Russia's efforts to uh, send uh, its uh, uh, information reaches Ukraine as well. So we need help here, and I am actually asking, uh, ma making an appeal for help to deliver even technologically our radio and TV signal to the um, uh, adjoining territories uh, and temporarily occupied territories, we need to uh, get more capacity to send our messages there. So our new, our message today is that uh, uh, greater international pressure on the occupying country will allow to avoid uh, frozen uh, freezing of this conflict. Nagorno Karabakh shows us that um, a frozen conflict may explode one day. And uh, I think there are such opportunities. We just need to make efforts together. We'll be very thankful for the support uh, for Ukraine, both along the lines of sanctions as well as other uh, political and diplomatic pressures, uh, pressures. I want to conclude with one just simple example. Recently, uh, uh, our government adopted uh, uh, sectoral sanctions uh, against uh, Nicaragua. Why? Because Nicaragua, uh, 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 by ignoring uh, 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 Russia, uh, Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, they opened a um, consulate uh, office in uh, Crimea, and they appointed an individual uh, who uh, had been um, uh, sentenced by Ukrainian court uh, as that consul that's a demonstrative uh, disrespect um, uh, of Ukraine's uh, statehood. And so the government adopted that, that uh, decision. The, the, the president is going to uh, approve, approve it and the, as well as the parliament. So this is a signal that you cannot act like this and uh, disrespect another country's sovereignty. I think this will be a significant demonstration to the world who is uh, the aggressor and who uh, needs help. I will not take more of your time. I'm ready to answer any question. You're welcome. Please ask. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your uh, cogent remarks.
I'd like to turn now to uh, Resia Lutsevich, who is, uh, Ms. Lutsevich is the Senior Fellow and Director of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House in London. Ms. Lutsevich, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for hosting and giving an opportunity to discuss what could be done about the conflict that is gripping uh, Ukraine for now seven years. And uh, I think it's important for all of us to understand the origins of the conflict if we are trying to find the solutions for today. And from my perspective, it's the legacy of still of the collapse of the Soviet Union, where in a way, Russian's logic, current Kremlin regime logic, is to preserve control of the periphery, and in particularly, <clears throat> to maintain its pathway also as a European power. That's where Ukraine comes into play. And that's why Ukraine is so important for current Kremlin regime. So we have quite an entrenched position on the side of the President Putin and Russia, why Ukraine matters so much. So in a way, what we see in Donbass and with the annexation of Crimea, yes, it's an annexation of the territory, but it's also about the future modalities of Ukrainian statehood. Because in a way, Russia wants to deny that Ukraine can be a viable independent state. Uh, and what it's trying to achieve in the, as an end game is Ukraine's limited sovereignty. And it's unfortunate that the Minsk agreements are used by Russia that in a way denies even its engagement in the conflict for this matter. Uh, politically, Minsk's agreements are, you know, quite controversial inside Ukraine. Uh, few Ukrainians see the outcomes of um, Minsk agreements, and it's being used all the time to polarize and divide society. Local elections that Russia was so much pushing to uh, organize on the occupied territories of Donbass is simply there to legalize their proxies, those Russian citizens that Vice Prime Minister was talking about that are right now running these territories. And um, of course, it's costly for Russia. You know, there's an estimate that they spend around five billion to just uh, maintain Donbass and around two Crimea. You know, it's, it's not a cheap um, uh, aventure for them. But I think they are prepared to pay the price exactly uh, to um, create pressure on the rest of Ukrainian politics using this conflict. So unless the West is prepared to abandon Ukraine or Ukraine is prepared to surrender its independence, it will be a difficult relationship both for Ukraine with Russia and for the West with Russia. And I think this is something fundamentally we all have to prepare. So answering to the question whether there's really a new opening that we could use right now, my answer is no. There's not such a new opportunity that uh, is ripe. But it does not mean that we shouldn't prepare for it in the future. And in this context, I think for Ukraine, what should be a viable strategy jointly with its partners? It's interesting that there is a new national security strategy that was just adopted by, by Kiev recently, looking ahead for the next five years. And this document talks about deterrence, it talks about resilience, and it talks about cooperation with Western partners. Um, I mean, on the deterrent side, I'll focus less, but just mention, because I'm joining you from London, that we had a quite successful state visit of President Zelensky to the United Kingdom, signing a strategic operation agreement bilaterally with the United Kingdom that includes 1.5 billion loan to uh, uh, produce new missile carrier naval vessels that will create additional deterrence in the Black Sea. And that is an important fact. But I would like to focus a bit more on resilience, something that I think um, Ukrainians with its Western partners should try to really strengthen in Ukraine. I mean, we all live in times of turbulence. There's instability, complexity, uncertainty. And this seems like a feature that is so important for all of our societies and is so important for peace. Uh, we've been looking at um, this uh, idea of resilience in the region uh, and, and specifically at what are the vulnerabilities that make Ukrainian society vulnerable to Russian negative influence. And of course, number one, if we look at uh, the situation, it's an armed conflict. Number two, it's corruption. It's the domest internal domestic system that enables a lot of these negative influences to uh, perpetrate, and it's also nature of Ukrainian politics. But because we are talking about conflict, I would like to say that um, 
as I said, it's not just about those occupied territories and people in the contact line. 21% of Ukrainians had negative experience due to conflict. It's a lot of it's a lot of people. There is increased violence, the circulation of firearms, the the environmental threats that are coming from from the region and conflict these polarizing societies. This is, that is something very dangerous for democracies. I'm sure you know in the United States how dangerous polarizations could be, how it tears the fabric of the society and actually damages possibility for consensus and, and, and um, um, compromise that is so much needed for democracy. So in Ukraine also, if you look at the society and you, if you ask a question, is society ripe for a resolution? In, in fact, Ukrainian society is, is quite, you know, is, is quite unsure about what is the West Bay. Of course, we, Ukrainians want to finish the war, but they find it difficult to answer what is the best way you know, to stop this war? Is it the uh, continue the current blockade? Is it to uh, provide autonomous status? Is it to uh, separate on bus? Uh, is it to maintain the status quo? So Ukraine still has to do a lot internally inside of its society to have a conversation about the future of Donbass and the future of Crimea. So, um, as I said, conflict creates inside Ukraine quite strong feeling of heightened insecurity. Uh, I mean, on top of that, you have COVID, you have economic difficulties, you have uh, quite strong migration, you know, to find jobs everywhere. So society is, is quite anxious. But I think also on the positive side, why resilience is a good answer for Ukraine and the current leadership in Kiev and civil society should carefully look how to um, deploy this framework is because Ukrainians are accustomed to living in instability. Ukrainians have been through various and many traumas and they have overcome. They have persevered in most recent history, Chernobyl, you go back, Afghan war, you go back, you know, Holodomor, repressions, and Ukraine still stands. And this is what Putin, what comes to a surprise to Putin, uh, this is Ukraine's uh, capacity to persevere and Western unity. So I do think that, um, not to take more time to have more discussion, what could be the three pillars of resilience in Ukraine? And I'm pleased that the Vice Prime Minister mentioned more human-focused efforts uh, within the, the deoccupied territories of Donbass and reaching out to those Ukrainians who are uh, uh, right now outside of Ukraine's nationhood. Uh, I think it's also Ukraine's national security strategy is very human focused and it's a positive sign. I think um, uh, we live in a society and Ukraine is trying to show that it's a real humanistic society based on respect for human rights and respect for rule of law. And this is where Ukrainians will feel pride and ownership of, 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 its, um, of, of the country. So these three pillars, the way we see them, and we have quite extensive report that you can look at Chatham House website on Ukraine's resilience. Number one, Ukraine needs to revamp its institutions. And that means to complete the decentralization process because it came as a legacy of very centralized Soviet state state and to really fix governance that will deliver effective services. Right now, Ukraine almost twice lags behind Poland in the effectiveness of its governance. And modern day effective state services are difficult. As I said, there is complexity, there's insecurity, crises of all kinds. But I think that um, together with the teams of local communities, because Ukraine is quite horizontal, the trust is spreading more horizontally rather than vertically to Kyiv. This team of teams of strong Ukrainian communities could build uh, something that can withstand these negative influences of Russian Federation that we are talking about. And mostly what it means, giving at stake for citizens in decision making, because disengagement of citizens for communities is dangerous. It's not just a matter of civil society development as we used to look at it. It's in Ukrainian case, a matter of national security. And it's very patchy because if you look at uh, Uzhorod, uh, Mykolaiv, Severodonets, only 13 people say that they are pleased with the way that they engage with their communities. It's very low. In Ivano-Frankivsk, where it's one of the highest, it's only 29%. So I think 
this is one of the pillars where citizens could really have a stake in Ukrainian uh, governance. Number two, it's internal cohesion, social cohesion. Why there's so much anxiety about reintegration of Donbass? Because a lot of people in center and west of Ukraine fear that this may hijack the future of European integration for Ukraine. Uh, and what is important is to look at the IDPs and, and, and veterans. It's a great opportunity to, that the Vice Prime Minister was talking about creating jobs, uh, about uh, supporting families, about mental health, because as I said, millions of, of people are affected by conflict, trauma, uh, but also building links, transport links, but also human links, exchanges, school exchanges. I mean, COVID makes all of this difficult, but we could use this time to prepare uh, for, what, uh, for what will come. And the third pillar is cognitive resilience and media. Uh, you know, uh, information is a fuel for democracy. If citizens are not given uh, good quality information to judge policies, how, how is society gonna work democratically? We, we all know it's impossible. So I think nurturing the public information sources, uh, investing in media, but not only the central level, but also at the regional community level, because as I said, when Ukraine decentralizes, these communities get more powers financially, decision-making, and it's important that these communities share the same values, that they share the same vision for Ukraine, the same reform agenda, so that the country can move in one step rather than being pulled in different directions. So just to conclude, I would like to say that uh, I think we cannot expect much from Putin to step back and allow you know, Ukraine to have peace on Ukrainian terms, observing all those red lines that Vice Prime Minister mentioned. It would be great, but it's a bit of a utopian world. In the real world, I think Ukraine has to prepare to stay strong with its allies, because Russia wanted to damage and defeat Ukraine, but it didn't. Western sanctions so far also didn't defeat Russia. There are different pressures, but the struggle goes on. And I think Ukraine is so important, not just for the millions of Ukrainians living at home, but also for millions of Belarusians right now who are fighting for the future that they want, that will be free and democratic and successful Ukraine. Uh, is that inspiration that we need in the region for these countries and for worldwide democracy. So I will stop here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Arisia, thank you so much uh, for your provocative comments and interesting comments. I'm turning it over now to Ambassador Taylor. Don, thank you, Arisia. Thank you. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you very much for, for being here. I'm still watching George Kemp's chair and it looks like, he, or at least his little box and he's not yet with us. So I'm going to try just very briefly uh, to summarize some of the things that I've heard George say, but also that uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began, said last night. Uh, he, he, I was in touch with him last night. Um, he's in Bangladesh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, otherwise, he would, uh, would love to have the conversation with you. He pointed out, the, uh, Secretary Began pointed out to me uh, last night that uh, that the deputy prime minister, prime Min deputy prime minister Reznikov, has done an outstanding job, um, and he said that uh, the deputy prime minister and the Zelensky administration's efforts have produced the most progress in six years, according to Steve Began. Um, he said that the strong leadership of the Ukrainian government engaging directly with Russia makes it that much easier for the U.S. to play an important supporting role. And he wanted to emphasize that. The United States needs to be present, he said, um, but the Ukrainians have to lead the way uh, to, a, to a solution. Many of us heard uh, the Deputy Secretary um, at the YES conference um, where he made a couple of related points. And again, um, if George Kent joins us, um, he, can, he can elaborate. Um, Steve Began said that the sequence on how to solve Donbass, how to solve Donbass, or how to solve the the problem in, in Ukraine more broadly is Donbass first, and then Crimea. I mean that uh, he was the focus focused first on Donbass and then Crimea. He said that even though the Minsk agreements were not perfect, to say the least, that's the path we have to be on for now. For now, he emphasized the uh, uh, that that there may be have to be changes as the Deputy Prime Minister indicated earlier. Um, 
You talked about the ceasefire, um, with, which, as people in Ukraine know, was controversial um, at the outset and politically risky. Um, but Steve Began uh, thought that this was a wise choice and a wise move, and people are not, Ukrainian soldiers in particular, are not being killed every week as, as they were. Um, he was very clear that the letter of the Minsk agreements, notwithstanding the particular, uh, the, the, the specifics of the Minsk agreements, notwithstanding, security must come first. And what that means is Ukraine or an international uh, organization or force that the deputy prime minister talked about from the Croatian experience um, would have to be there to provide security and would have to control the border before elections take place. Uh, he was very clear about that. I've heard George Kent made that, make that same, same point. The international border must be controlled by Ukraine or an international force before credible free and fair elections can be held in Donbass. And this may call for an international force. Uh, Steve Biggin talks about the OSCE, a multinational force, a coalition of the willing uh, to be present in Donbass, present in Donbass to provide security uh, for the preparation for the elections. U.S. and EU will have an important role, in particular in finance and reconstruction. Deputy Prime Minister talked about the, the important uh, component of this whole resolution of being reconstruction financing and reintegration. Um, and Arisia talked uh, about that as well. The Deputy Secretary, Deputy Began, said that very clearly um, that the Russians need to understand that economic sanctions associated with the Russians' actions in, in Donbass as distinct from those associated with Crimea, won't be lifted until the Russians are out of Donbass and the border is back in Ukrainian control. That was a strong message that the, that the Deputy Secretary brought. He went on to say that the economic sanctions could even be strengthened if the Russians don't work constructively to resolve the conflict. Now, this is an important signal. Secretary Began said that the United States would certainly consider a request for more active participation. Um, and efforts to find peace, but that the important decisions must be agreed between Ukrainians and Russians. He finally came away from his visit to Kiev last month with George Kent, uh, more optimistic than he had been about Ukraine's future, um, and he looks forward to that. When George joins us, um, he can elaborate. And so, Don, with that, let me turn it back over to you for questions, discussion among the, the participants here, and suggestions from from the audience. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, we are gonna have a uh, question and answer period, but in this transitional from that, that this, these very interesting comments to then, I wanted to use the, the moderator's prerogative for one question, and this goes back to the, some of the comments of the, the minister. Uh, the issue of Russian intentions is critical here, and a lot of people think that the Russians given all the things that Minister Reznikov talked about, the disease, economic trouble, fall of oil prices, that the Russians may be willing to reach a deal in some way. Uh, Ms. Lutsevich seemed to be more skeptical about that, but I wanted to raise that question right at the outset, part one. And part two would be, what could we do on our side to encourage some kind of movement on the Russian side? I think Mr. Reznik Minister Reznikov will start with you, but welcome comments from anybody else. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. I would like to repeat, we know the mindset of Russians very well because we all uh, had come from the same cradle of the Soviet Union. There are some, uh, th they, that mentality is understandable for us. And I'm sure they are, they are very pragmatic, their government especially. This is why at this time Donbass becomes a big burden for Russia's economy. I would like to remind you that according to what we know, 1.3 billion US dollars is only spent there to nourish uh, of the occupied territories budgets. Also, according to our estimates, they spend 3.7 
uh, billion for, uh, for 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 other needs. So totally, they 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 lose about five billion per year, which is already thirty billion lost in six years. And uh, they can see that the Novorossiya project was a failure. So pragmatically, they need to leave. But the question is, what they want to bargain for? So the first thing that comes to the mind is they, they would like to persuade the leaders of other countries, the United States, Britain, um, uh, Canada, and the EU, saying, how about we leave Donbas, you persuade Ukraine to give up Crimea, and that, uh, that's, that, that will be it. But you have to understand that Ukraine will never accept that, that proposition. You, you sh you sh nobody should even think about it. Crimea is occupied, Sevastopol is occupied. They are Ukrainian and uh, complete uh, renewal of Ukrainian uh, territory and dignity uh, is, is needed. So, so Russia needs something else to in order to avoid the impression that they were defeated in this war because they show that they are a strong uh, power and pretend they are mediators. So uh, they need to look for an option that would show them, uh, give them a chance to uh, save their face and demonstrate that they uh, achieved a victory. So uh, the uh, the idea of uh, further empowerment of uh, uh, alliance uh, supporting Ukraine and strengthening the uh, the sanctions, economic sanctions, uh, so that Russia would uh, show their victory in saving the the, the costs of staying. Then. Uh, uh, so, so countries such as the the U.S. Uh, NATO countries might come up with more things to bring on the table, and it's not a secret for us that Russia is waiting for outcomes of U.S. presidential elections. I can feel, based on how the negotiations are moving. Uh, one way or another, they are trying to delay the uh, negotiations and the cons cons consultations. Uh, all, uh, but but I really uh, had the chance to speak with uh, Deputy Secretary Bihun in this office, in this room, and uh, he told me that U.S. policy will not change in any way. The philosophy of deep state is working, and the support of the Ukrainian uh, state will not uh, change on behalf of the United States. We are very thankful for this message. So please uh, give uh, Mr. Bihun uh, my words of gratitude, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing consultations and uh, wait to see what Russia is uh, ready to bargain for. They, it's, it's a pragmatic issue. They have no pragmatic interest in the Donbas, none economic or ethnic or religious, no kind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we get to the q and I wanted to tell our viewers and listeners that you use the chat function to um, uh, send your questions to me and our team and also identify yourself, uh, please. Uh, and I think it's most of us are just accustomed to it now. Hit chat and, and please ask your question. Uh, I want to ask one more question before we go to the Q&A and that's for Ambassador uh, Yelchinka. And that's to say, uh, sir, uh, could you say a word about the influence of the Belarus crisis on uh, Ukraine security situation? We see a lot of military activity, we see other things. Could you, in a minute or two, give your give, a, give us a better sense of that? Well, uh, I think that, of course, this influence is very high. And uh, it was stressed in, in many cases by the foreign minister of Ukraine, by President Zelensky, uh, by prime minister and, and many politicians in Berkhovna Rada, in particular. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I would add to that that, uh, uh, you know, there are sort of very visible uh, effects of the situation in, in Belarus, 
which influence on Ukraine, like, uh, as you mentioned, the presence of the Russian troops there, uh, and the troops were there even before, and they were along the border between uh, Belarus and, uh, and Ukraine. But of course, uh, the number of troops was increased later as a result of uh, Lukashenko's request to Putin. Uh, uh, you know, another thing which is not so visible, but uh, goes uh, without any question, that there is a, a heavy presence of the Russian security personnel uh, all over the um, Belarusian authorities. Uh, uh, another thing is that Belarus is a part of the so-called Union state between Russia and Belarus. And there are things which are enshrined in the treaty on the creation of this state, which not not many people uh, you know noticed. For example, that uh, both countries uh, sort of provide for the uh, common position on international issues, which which means in fact uh, that Belarus doesn't have any foreign policy. It does have the common foreign policy of Russia and Belarus, and they need to follow this. Uh, now on the kind of invisible things, which not many people mentioned, and this is probably uh, more my personal opinion based on my experience uh, uh, in uh, you know, communication with Belarusian diplomats, uh, mostly in New York at the United Nations, but uh, also bilaterally, uh, that uh, judging from the statements of Mrs. Tikhanovskaya, uh, we should not expect any dramatic and positive changes in the position of Belarus with regard to Ukraine in case if, if she or any other representative of the opposition would come to power in Belarus, uh, which, which makes me quite pessimistic. But the ground for optimism, on the other hand, is that uh, the relations between the people of Ukraine and Belarus are the best proof that Belarus in general as a public society, doesn't have any, you know, negative feelings or negative intentions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. We also have a very long history of, uh, you know, joint life in the former Soviet Union, and and even before that, we are neighbors. There are very close, uh, you know, economic links. Uh, there is an active exchange of people across the border between Ukraine and Belarus, even now. Uh, you know, many, many Belarusians, uh, uh, after the events uh, of August, after the presidential elections in Belarus, decided to go and, and, and stay in Ukraine for the time being. So, generally speaking, uh, uh, to sum up, I'm optimistic. In, in any outcome of the situation in Belarus, uh, you know, the future of our relations, I think, would be positive. Thank you, sir. And I would note for the group, the, the audience, that Deputy Assistant Secretary Kent has joined us, uh, including his famous bow tie. And welcome, George. And uh, uh, please, uh, we welcome remarks from you about the U.S. policy and what's going on in the region. And uh, hope you can stay for any Q's and A's that uh, uh, people have from the audience. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, uh, Bill. Uh, and uh, I guess a good good segue hearing uh, the ambassador talk about Belarus, since I was just in a, a conversation about uh, Belarus. So uh, I, I think, uh, as I understand it, uh, Bill uh, summarized what Deputy Secretary Began's approach was in his commentary several weeks ago as part of the, the yes uh, discussions and Applebaum curated a conversation with him. Uh, the U.S. obviously supports successful Ukraine. We support Ukraine's territorial integrity. Do the entirety of Donbass is Ukraine. And uh, going to the, the theme of the event, um, is, uh, uh, is there a successful resolution possible? It's always possible. It depends on the political will of the parties. Uh, the uh, basic outlines of what was agreed to in Minsk in September uh, 
2014 and February 2015 uh, was meant to be implemented by the end of 2015. Obviously, we're now almost five years beyond that. And it's a great sign that for the first time in uh, six years, uh, more or less, uh, the large-scale fighting has ceased. Uh, but if we look forward to the recovery of Ukrainian sovereignty, if we look forward to allowing the region to move forward, um, you can't have an election process without secure borders. And I'm sure Deputy Prime Minister Reznikov went in some of his innovative ideas to look and approach that. But the U.S. very much supports Ukraine in insisting on the recovery of sovereignty uh, and uh, international standards for elections include uh, the pre-election conditions. So I think you have to get the conditions right first. And we are supportive of uh, Ukrainian officials like Deputy Prime Minister Reznikov uh, to help the country move forward. And I'll just stop there and participate in Q&A. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, I want to take a call from the floor from my colleague, Dr. Paul Carter, who's asking about uh, the specific and we talked about this a little bit earlier with Minister Reznikov, the specific policy things we might be able to do to get some movement on the Russian side. Uh, easing sanctions, maybe, George, this is something for you. Specific policy things, inclusion in the G8, something else, part of a grand bargain, a term that's dirty to my ears, but people do talk about it. So, uh, George, could you give us some thoughts about what, what wiggle room do we might have trying to get some movement on the process? Well, I think, again, we're supportive of Ukraine's positions and Ukraine's sovereignty. And the political will uh, is not lacking uh, from Kyiv. And I think uh, if you look at this year with some of the ideas that Pre Deputy Prime Minister Reznikov has put on the table, if you go all the way back to 2015, when it was Roman Besmertny who's putting creative ideas on the table, the lack of willingness and commitment from Kyiv has never been the issue. It's the issue of the willingness uh, on the part of uh, Russia and the Kremlin to live up to their obligations that President Putin agreed to um, in Minsk uh, in his 17 hours of discussion with Chancellor Merkel, uh, French President Hollande, and, and then President Poroshenko of Ukraine. So uh, it's not a matter of us giving inducements to the Russians. The Russians made commitments. They need to live up to them. Uh, I do think that the international community uh, has a role of reminding everyone of what happened, uh, of what the uh, commitments were, and to uh, hold firm on the expectations. And I, I do recall in 2015 and 2016, there was a question, uh, would there be the collective will on the part of the West, whether it was the US or whether it was uh, Western European countries, to continue to roll over sanctions on Russia? And there were dire predictions in 2016 that, you know, we might get another round in June of 2016, but that would be it. By the end of you know, December 2016, uh, the EU would have lost uh, its will and we would no longer have sanctions. And they just keep on getting rolled over every six months. Uh, and so the things we were worried about in terms of that transatlantic and particularly some Western European countries' commitments um, have now been baked into the process and people accept that as a baseline. And the EU just recently uh, extended uh, additional sanctions on the companies that built the Kerch Bridge, Crimea. It's not Donbass, but it's Crimea. And so I think um, what is important is not that we look to add additional inducements on the table uh, to see if the Russians will um, uh, change their behavior. Uh, it was that we need to stand firm, make clear the expectation, and if Russia, we have always said from the very beginning, dating back to 2014, if Russia is willing to take the steps to restore Ukrainian sovereignty over Ukrainian territory in the Donbass and Crimea, then uh, we can lift the sanctions and move forward with a renewed relationship. Um, but we have not seen that happen. And a year ago, the Ukrainian government under uh, then new President Zelensky took a very controversial step to endorse what was known as the Steinmeier formula uh, on what would happen on the last day after having free and fair elections, and then certain steps would be taken. Uh, and the Russians put that in their pocket. Uh, they pocketed it and didn't make any sort of response on the security end uh, or to show that they were willing to take those other steps. So again, I think the issue is to make clear what our expectations are, uh, to continue to support Ukraine, support Ukraine 
in defending its territorial integrity and sovereignty, support Ukraine in the process of reform. And when it's clear that Ukraine as a country will succeed and move forward, uh, I think that strengthens the Ukrainian position and puts pressure on Russia to live up to their commitments. Thank you, George. Uh, now, uh, Arisha has a two-finger intervention on the issue. Arisha, go ahead. Thank you very much, Don. I, I, because we've mentioned Belarus, I, and I remember having a conversation with the Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexeyevich, who, when I asked her what we can do for Belarus, she said support Ukraine, that the West should support Ukraine. Now, if you ask me what you can do for Ukraine, I would say support the independence of Belarus, because what, what, what Russia sees, it's a one theater of influence. It's not so much par partitioning Belarus, Ukraine, uh, you know, and, and its periphery. And it's so important that Belarus manages to preserve at least that limited sovereignty it had before and hopefully restores its full sovereignty. And also on the energy Energy security side. I think it's so critical that Ukraine as a country remains its, its uh, independence of energy supply and the Nord Stream 2 project, which of course the United States did a great, uh, you know, favor in, in, in uh, strengthening Ukraine's position, but the Europeans and, and other Ukraine's partners, unfortunately, even after Navalny's poisoning, are taking a very cautious step. So uh, I would hope that this transatlantic discussion on the Nord Stream and pressure on making sure that project stops continues. Thank you. Thank you, Arisia. Uh, we have a question from the audience from uh, Elise Giuliano at Columbia University, who's talking about uh, a very interesting question, the relationship between Ukrainian public opinion and the actions of the policies of the government. There seems to be some polarization, as uh, Arisia mentioned earlier, between those who want to compromise or those who want to strong to continue a very high level of resistance. And uh, I think a lot of us who follow Ukraine closely might also ask the same question. So let me pose this question to Deputy Minister Reznikov and talk about public opinion, which is a, a Ukraine is a democracy, and uh, we're very curious about how that is factored in, uh, sir, and how you, you see the landscape. Thank you for your question. I would like to uh, express maybe a desperate persuasion. Uh, and I want to declare that uh, public opinion is not simply uh, meaningful for the Ukrainian government, but it really uh, is taken into account when we make our decisions. Uh, communication might not always be uh, really uh, good with our society, but we are trying to look at what people are thinking. And when we uh, make decisions, we try to correct our decisions or else to explain to the public why certain steps are necessary, starting from uh, uh, quarantine uh, steps for uh, COVID uh, restrictions, because nobody wants to live in those restrictions and the lockdown without uh, disco parties or restaurants, you know what I'm talking about. But we have to explain all those things to the people. As for our theme of uh, war with the Russian Federation and attempts to uh, uh, settle for peace, this is a very sensitive theme and uh, we, it's important for us to signal to the public that this is not a zarada, as Ukrainians say, not a betrayal we are staying in this uh, hybrid war uh, in the information field and the Russian media have influence in Ukraine or there may be critical attitude of our political opponents inside Ukraine. So a simple explanation. We all are heirs of the, the of, of um, we inherited a gene of critical, skeptical uh, uh, outlook since uh, the primeval days. Uh, people had this uh, critical expectations. Um, they always uh, expected were prepared for the worst. Those uh, who were prepared for the worst were better uh, survivors. Uh, in the primeval time. So, so we inherited this gene. 
And this is why we have to explain to people very well what is going on. This is why we always articulate very clearly what the red lines are, that there is no uh, betrayal of national interests, and uh, that our delegation that meets in the uh, tripartite uh, uh, consultation group and in the Minsk format. <clears throat> so when we are now working on the uh, uh, strategy for redevelopment of uh, regions of Donbas. We, dro we drove all along the uh, separation line, 420 kilometers. We talked to local residents and asked them what is what it is exactly you want, and that's what we heard from them. They want um, uh, to rebuild uh, capacity of communities, uh, create uh, jobs. They want to rebuild their little infrastructure of those towns and villages. We took all that into account. We are putting this into the strategy and every ministry is doing the same. So which is why I would like to uh, say that yes, uh, public opinion uh, matters and we are a democracy unlike our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, unfortunately, we're running out of time and uh, we can, I hope we can continue this again in the future. Uh, uh, and certainly USIP and our great team is willing to uh, continue working with all of you on these critical questions. I wanted to close out by turning it over to Ambassador Taylor for a, a, final, a final word. John, thank you very much. And let me let me thank uh, Deputy Prime Minister for joining us here today and for his good work commended by the Deputy Secretary of State, George Kent, for uh, jumping out of a meeting on uh, Belarus to come have a good conversation with us on uh, on Ukraine. Arisia, thank you very much for your suggestions and ideas um, and dose of realism on, on how do we uh, uh, how, how we uh, move forward. Ambassador Yeltsenko, thank you very much for helping us put this together and, and sponsoring this. Let me also just say, Leslie Minnie and Matt Lotus did a nice job on uh, putting this together. And uh, Peter Wojciechowski, uh, thank you very much for your interpretation. Uh, the, we couldn't do it with, without you. So let me just end uh, where George started and where uh, Deputy Secretary Steve Began, um point, his point is, we strongly support the Ukrainian effort to end this war on Ukrainian terms. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're there to help, we're there to support. It has to be led by Ukrainians. Um, they have to come to the agreement, but we are, we are strong supporters. And, and the way, we, what we've tried to do here today is think about ways that we can be supported. So we'll continue that. As Don said, this, this is uh, uh, an ongoing conversation. We look forward to more. And let me, with that, thank all for joining, thank the audience for their questions, and we look forward to uh, further conversations. Thank you all very much.